Greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute. My name is Michael Le Chevalier and I serve as associate director here. For those who do not know, Lumen Christi was founded by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago in 1997. And our mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a living dialogue partner here at the University of Chicago, within the academy and across our broader society. We do this through courses, lectures, summer seminars for graduate and undergraduate students and, and virtual events like these. Now, I just wanted to highlight for you a few of our upcoming events. Uh, one of the exciting projects uh, that I've been able to be involved with uh, behind the scenes at Lumen Christi is helping to get started a new institute inspired by the model of the Lumen Christi Institute at Harvard through the Harvard Catholic Center called the Harvard Catholic Forum. And I'd like to invite you to join this Saturday for the fruits of this ongoing partnership um, with the last installment of our jointly presented series on faith in art with Gavin Bailey on the Virgin Mary in the art of Latin America, 1520 to 1820. Our commitment to present the Catholic intellectual tradition in its depth and breadth continues with our eight week long series on Hispanic theology, which continues this Tuesday with Michelle Gonzalez Maldonado, Peter Casarella, and Juan Soto on beauty and justice in the city. And finally, our, our monthly series um, concludes this academic year, this monthly series on the saints that is co-presented with the Bolandist Society um, with a final event that is uh, on the work of the Bolandists themselves and the critical study of the lives of the saints. And this event features one of the Bolandists Father Robert Godding and is entitled From 92 Pages to More Than 60,000, How the Bolandists Created the Science of the Saints. You can find links to register for all of these and for more information within the chat. Now today's event is especially exciting for us at the Lumen Christi Institute because it helps bring together some of those very scholars who helped inspire the founding of the Lumen Christi Institute and with their contributions over the years continue to make us a living center for Catholic intellectual thought. Um, it's a great honor to host, in addition, of course, to um, Professor Wilhelmine Otten and Professor Sandra Schneiders, Father David Tracy and Bernard McGinn, who are right there at the beginnings of the Lumen Christi Institute. In fact, we're even before that teachers of Thomas Levergood, our executive director and founder. Um, and it's um, quite an honor to be hosting an event that's not only by a work, um, by uh, Bernard McGinn, The Crisis of Mysticism, but in fact, the last of the Presence of God series, volume seven, um, in fact, book nine. Um, you in fact can find a link to purchase this book um, within the chat as well. Um, and Herder and Herder has actually made a 30% um, discount for this book available um, throughout uh, the coming month. Um, Today's event is co-sponsored by the Collegium Institute, the Martin Marty Center for Public Understanding of Religion and Herder and Herder. I'm grateful to our co-sponsors today for helping to ensure the success of today's event. And I'd invite you to help ensure the success of our programming in three different ways. First, you can join our mailing list, follow us on social media and share word about these events with others. Word of mouth, even in a time of pandemic continues to be the most effective ways of inviting people into this broad dialogue with the Christian intellectual tradition. And for those who are watching us on YouTube, you can even like us or leave feedback on our podcasts and help big tech and algorithms bend towards the Catholic intellectual tradition. A second way you can help. At the end of our event, you'll be invited to participate in a survey that will help us to gauge what we're doing right and what could be improved within our programming. Filling it out, you'll enter to win a raffle, uh, enter a raffle to win a gift card to our favorite local independent bookstore, the Seminary Co-op. Finally, you can support us today financially by donating at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate, helping us to continue to put on events like these for free for viewers like you. During today's event, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. You can, however, post a question at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. In addition to questions being read by our moderator, we will also give voice to audience members to ask the questions that they pose there. 
Today's program is being recorded and will stream from our YouTube page and be posted to our website um, so that it's easy for you to revisit this talk and to share it with others. A link is already included in your confirmation email and will also be sent to you 24 hour, hours after the event tomorrow. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's moderator who will introduce our speakers. Professor Wilhelmine Otten is Professor of Theology and the History of Christianity um, at the Divinity School and also in the college. Um, associate faculty in the Department of History, Social Sciences Division at the University of Chicago. She is also the faculty director of one of my favorite partners to put on programs with the Martin Marty Center for the Public Understanding of Religion. Professor Wilhelmine Ahn, I invite you to unmute yourself and to turn on your screen. Thank you, uh, Michael, for this introduction and welcome everybody also on behalf of the Marty Center, uh, which as Michael mentioned, is co-sponsoring this event with Lumen Christi. I will briefly introduce um, today's speakers, three of them, um, with a starring role for Professor Bernard McGinn, and afterwards, um, we'll continue with their presentations. I would also say at the beginning already that people can put their questions and in the in the box for that um, as as um, all the speakers are are giving their talks. So to begin, um, the starring role today is for Professor Bernard McGinn, the Naomi Shenstone Donnelly Professor Emeritus of Historical Theology and of the History of Christianity in the Divinity School and the Committees on Medieval Studies and on General Studies at the University of Chicago. Professor McGinn, who holds a uh, licentiate from the Gregorian and did his PhD at Brandeis, taught at the University of Chicago from 1969 to 2003. He's written extensively about the history of apocalyptic thought, spirituality, and mysticism. His many books include Antichrist, 2000 Years of the Human Fascination with Evil, The Presence of God, what we're talking about today, a multi-volume history of Western Christian mysticism, and most recently, Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, a biography. Professor McGinn is also very well known to many of you because of his uh, editorial um, role for the series Classics in Western Spirituality. And I can honestly say that it would be very hard to teach what I'm teaching without that series of, I think, under his editorial leadership, about 135 volumes. Next, we have Professor David Tracy, who's the Andrew Thomas Greeley and Grace McNichols Greeley Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Catholic Studies and Professor of Theology and the Philosophy of Religion in the Divinity School. Um, he has an STL um, uh, and a PhD from the Gregorian or a sacred theology degree from the Gregorian. And he taught at the University of Chicago Divinity School from 1969 to 2007. Um, he taught there a wide variety of courses in contemporary theology, uh, but also philosophy, religion, and, con and collaborating with classics and many other fields. Um, indeed, offered, he's offered classes in philosophical, systematic, and constructive theology and hermeneutics, and courses dealing with issues and persons in religion and modern thought. His publications, and I'm just mentioning a few, include The Analogical Imagination, Christian Theology and the Culture of Pluralism, and On Naming the Present, Reflections on God, Hermeneutics, and the Church. Most recently, Professor um, Tracy published a two-volume anthology of many of his articles, um, the first called Fragments and the second called Filaments, and both came out with the University of Chicago Press and he's currently at work on a book on God. And then we have Professor Sandra Schneiders, Professor Emerita of New Testament Studies and Christian Spirituality at the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University. Among, uh, she did an STL also at the Institut Catholique and um, got her sacred theology degree from the Gregorian in Rome. So we have three, three alumni of the Gregorian of Rome um, here this after, this evening. Among her many publications are Prophets in Their Own Country, 
Women Religious Bearing Witness to the Gospel in a Troubled Church from 2012. Um, Professor um, um, uh, Schneiders won't know this, but I, I don't read widely, I should say, in New Testament studies, but I have been very impressed and, and, and profited immensely from a very early article that she did called Scripture and Spirituality in 1985, and it was published in the first of a three-volume work edited by Professor McGinn on Christian spirituality. Um, her work is then uh, mostly focused in biblical studies with a special interest in the Gospel of John, the theory of biblical interpretation, and the history and theology of religious life and mystical experience. She's a member of the Sisters, Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary of Monroe, Michigan. And at this point, I invite all the speakers to unmute themselves and turn on the camera. I guess I'm there. Yes, I think you are all there, <laughs> perfectly on cue. <laughs> it could be better. Um, and with that, I would um, begin by inviting um, Professor McGinn, and actually we've agreed that we will be on a first name basis. So I invite Bernie to speak first. After him, it will be Sandra, and after her, it will be David. So there will be three um, presentations now. Please go ahead, Bernie. Uh, the first thing I want to say is a great uh, uh, depth, from the depth of my heart, thanks. Great thanks to the Lumen Christi Institute, uh, to the Marty Center, to my publisher, Herder and Herder, for sponsoring this. But the most special thanks are due to those who are tuning in, uh, my readers over the years, and also those who are now watching. This project, The Presence of God, has been a long, long project. I could not have done it without the support of the many people who read these books, contacted me, and many of whom may be uh, tuning in tonight. I'm going to uh, speak very briefly in, in three sections. First, I should say something about the gestation of the presence of God. Uh, it's nine volumes. Volume six had to be split into three. Then I'm going to say a little bit more about uh, the significance of the crisis of mysticism, that is quietism. And then I might say just a little bit more about a few issues within, within that particular volume. Uh, the presence of God goes back more than 40 years. It was around 1980 or earlier that I first uh, realized through my teaching at the Divinity School, we had no theological history of mysticism that I could give to students in the courses that I was teaching. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe it would be possible to do that. I envisaged it originally as maybe a, perhaps consisting of some three volumes or so. And uh, so that was what I dedicated myself to. And as early as 1982, after some thoughts about that, I gave a, a paper at uh, General Theological Seminary in New York, in which I kind of outlined the way in which I was going to approach that. And many of the themes that I gave in that talk in February of 82 have uh, consistently been present in the whole history. Uh, the historical approach, <clears throat> the emphasis on presence of God, not necessarily union, the three layers of mysticism from its monastic beginnings to what I call a new mysticism of the 12th to 16th century, and then the crisis of mysticism in the 16th and 17th century. And also the fact that this was going to concentrate on mystical texts and the notion of mystical consciousness more than mystical experience, because I think consciousness embraces experience. So I embarked on this in the, in the early 1980s and uh, researched, talked about it, et cetera. It wasn't until uh, 1991 that I was able to actually begin publishing what I had originally conceived of as one volume dealing with the monastic mysticism from the second century to the 12th century had to split into two. What I call the foundations of mysticism in 91 and then the growth of mysticism up to the 12th century. Then later volumes, at least three of them, had to deal with the second period that I came to call the new mysticism. It began around 1200 and lasted down to at least uh, 1600. The, Chronology gets a little bit fuzzy. Uh, 
And these volumes were the flowering of mysticism, the harvest of mysticism, and the varieties of mysticism, which took me down to about 1600. But then I realized, of course, that uh, 1550, 1600 and on, very rich period, Reformation mysticism, often overlooked. The golden age of Spanish mysticism, and then the mysticism of France and the other Catholic countries. So it was originally going to be volume six split into three different parts that were published uh, separately. That brought me down to what I call the crisis of mysticism, which is basically about quietism, which is about what's been called the, the caesura of mysticism or the death of mysticism or as some French scholars have spoken about, uh, you know, they, they speak of the um, tragedy of mysticism. So Louis Cognier, or the rout of the mystics, so the French scholar Henri Bremont. This, these were the condemnations that took place between 1675 and 1700, in which important mystics, both in Italy and in France, and some of them Spanish, uh, you know, were condemned officially condemned by the papers. <coughs> a whole series of uh, documents and condemnations in 1687 and 1689. What I was trying to do with that, with this volume, is to answer the question, what happened? What happened? How is such a long and deep tradition rooted in the scriptures, as Sandra Snyder knows so well, brought to a kind of a moment of fruition in the second and third century and the great early fathers like Clement and Origen and others carried on in the East and West for over a millennium. How is that tradition of interior consciousness of God, contemplation, deep spirituality, how is it kind of pushed to the margins and by the institutional decisions that were made at that time? This was indeed a crisis of mysticism. And the interesting thing was, important as it was, it has not been much studied in recent tradition. It was in 1950, Ronald Knox's book, Enthusiasm, has two very interesting chapters on, on quietism. The last serious treatments of these in English. And it was only in 1973, Jean-Robert Amogat in, in France published a brief book uh, looking at quietism as a phenomenon across France, Spain, and Italy, et cetera. Many individual studies of quietism in France, less so in, Sp in Italy and, and in Spain, but there was a need for a general synoptic presentation of what was mysticism and, and, and what happened during the course of that period. And that's what I tried to do in the, in the crisis of mysticism. So I deal with a brief historical period in comparison with some of the other volumes but it's a very crucial period. There may not have been many uh, great mystical classic works written during those 25 years, but the uh, crucial question of what does mysticism mean in the history of Christianity was never more discussed, debated, and eventually, as I said, in a certain sense, subverted. So that's what this book tries to, uh, to look at through uh, the particular kinds of, uh, of chapters. And I'll say just a little bit more about, uh, about these, uh, the chapters. The book consists of five chapters. The first one is called From, uh, from Quietude to Quietism. Because quietude and the prayer of quiet were ancient themes in Christianity. John of the Cross, and especially Teresa of Avila, and depend, depending on the earlier Spanish uh, mystics, of this of the early 16th and 15th century, use those expressions over and over again. And uh, the whole issue of quietude and annihilation and resignation, these are deep themes in the history of Christianity. But how do these traditional themes somehow come to be under suspicion and attacked by institutional forces, central forces like the papacy itself but also within the national churches uh, and, and the church state systems in Spain uh, and, especially, and especially in France. So that's a long, difficult story. It does, I think, highlight the fact that suspicions of mysticism had been going on for many centuries, but it was not until the 17th century, 
and especially towards the end of the 17th century, that these suspicions exploded in terms of accusations, polemical treatises, and really a, a general confusion in the part of the, uh, of the Catholic Church. So that sets the background. The second chapter deals with quietism in Italy, often neglected, less well-known than the French quietists. And it deals primarily with Miguel de Molinos, a Spanish priest resident in Rome, very popular, who wrote a book called The Spiritual Guide in 1675. One of the best spiritual bestsellers ever. 20 translations in various places. Everybody was reading it, but many people were unhappy with it. The papacy intervened. First, it condemned Jesuits who opposed Molinos. But then, <laughs> two years later, Molinos himself was arrested, investigated, and eventually condemned. In the Bull of Condemnation, it's not a bull, it's, a, it's an apostolic letter, 68 propositions of Molinos are condemned by the Pope. Many of them certainly condemn the bull. None of them are taken from the spiritual guide. Along with Molinos was an Italian cardinal, Pier Matteo Petrucci, a very original mystic, almost unknown in the English-speaking world. So I investigated Petrucci. I found him, uh, as I said, a fascinating mystic. He too was condemned. And uh, a document was issued against him condemning 54 of his propositions. So you got a cardinal condemned for quietest tendencies, too much stress that is on passivity, on certain kinds of interior prayer, on annihilation of the soul, motifs that come under quietism. The next chapter is primarily moving to, the next chapters are primarily moving to France, which is what most uh, ordinary students of church history will be available uh, or, or will be available to most students of church history. So a, a chapter discuss, discusses early French quietism, by which I mean, you know, roughly from 1650 to the 1670. François Maléval from Marseille was eventually condemned, but I find nothing wrong and most readers find nothing wrong in Maléval's easy practice of prayer. The key figure is Madame Guillaume, one of the most controversial figures in the history of Christian mysticism. A French laywoman, husband dies, she becomes converted. She writes uh, spiritual treatises. She goes on an apostolic mission, which she feels is impelled by her, her mystical contact with God. And she becomes obviously very controversial, but she becomes also friendly with one of the up and coming heroes young man in the French church, Francois Fenelon, eventually to wind up, of course, as the Cardinal of Cambrai. So the story of the interaction between Guillaume and Fenelon from the late 1680s, 1688 through the 1699, is one of the most dramatic tales in the whole history of Christian mysticism, especially because they encountered tremendous opposition from <clears throat> Madame de Maintenon, who was the uh, secret wife of Louis XIV, who induces the powerful Jacques Benin ben uh, Bossuet, Bishop of Meaux, to oppose both Guillaume and also Fenelon, who was his former patron, uh, his former you know uh, student in a certain way. Uh, it's a long and complicated story, and that's the the, the brunt uh, <clears throat> of the uh, the big fourth chapter in this book. It winds up with a sad event. In 1699, Pope Innocent XII, under pressure from Louis XIV and others, issues a fairly mild condemnation of Fenelon's major mystical work, The Maxims of the Saints. A sad moment for the history of Christian mysticism because it didn't recover from that for almost two, two centuries. Now the book goes into what were the issues and why did the controversy reach such a height of intensity in the course of the, in the end of the, of the yeah, 17th century? Um, but that's what I tried to do. And that's what, I'll, <clears throat> that's what I'll leave you with right now for your comments and, and reflections. Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, that's wonderful. And, and a very good um, uh, survey of, of what is in the book also.
Um, I now would like to invite Sandra Schneiders for her response. Thank you, I mean, and thanks, Bernie, for that overview of the new book. Uh, I'm honored to participate in this celebration of the appearance of the seventh and final volume of Dr. Bernard McGinn's masterwork, The Presence of God, A History of Western Christian Mysticism, certainly one of the greatest modern works in spirituality in the English language. To say anything in 15 minutes or so, about a work of such magnitude is like attempting to put Lake Erie in a Coke bottle. Quantitatively impossible and qualitatively absurd. But I'm grateful for the occasion it has afforded me to reflect on the contemporary discipline of spirituality in which Dr. McGinn and I have participated for nearly the same period of time. He, from the perspective of the history of theology and mysticism, and I from the perspective of New Testament studies and spirituality. Where our interests overlap and interweave is that of the direct experience of God mediated through texts, or more generically, spirituality and hermeneutics. Short of the beatific vision, all, even direct, experience of God is for us humans mediated in some way. And mediation, whether textual or artistic or ritual or other, entails interpretation. Literary texts are of many kinds. But whether we are talking about the biblically inspired texts, for example, of John's Gospel, or the mystically inspired texts of Teresa of Avila, the twofold oscillating process of exegesis and hermeneutics, of establishing what the text says and then interpreting what the text means, for the reader, are the only human ingress we have to the textually mediated experience of God, as distinguished from speculative or theological knowledge about God. And the dialogical freedom, that is the text governance of interpretation and interpretation's enabling of meaning are both in service of the transformation of the reader. I tend to think that the difference between McGinn's approach to mystical texts and the use of, for example, biblical or spiritual texts in theology is that the not necessarily recognized or acknowledged methodological model of the first is the humanities and of the second is the natural sciences. Engagement with the aesthetic, the true mediated by, the true mediated by beauty transforms the hearer or viewer, not primarily through the acquisition of intellectual knowledge, but through the participation it enables of the reader or hearer or viewer in the beautiful and the true. The kind of knowing that not only enlightens the mind, but transforms the person. For example, anyone who reads Thomas Aquinas' first proof for the existence of God correctly should come to basically the same conclusion as someone else equally equipped who re reads the same text correctly. And Aquinas's personality is not a factor in the enlightenment, <coughs> but two people entering into a mystical text of Teresa of Avila may be equivalently enlightened, but in very different ways. The way two people seeing a play are equivalently, but not identically affected. To me, this distinction allows us to understand why the works of Bernard McGinn, why the work of Bernard McGinn is so important, not only as a resource for theology, but primarily for spirituality, both lived and theoretical or academic. By interpreting the mystical text, not primarily as a philosopher or even as a systematic theologian, but the way an actor, for example, interprets a character or a musician interprets a symphony. McGinn facilitates the participative and transformative engagement of the reader with the mystical text. What has come to be called in the field of spirituality self-implication, that is transform transformation rather than objectivity, that is enlightenment, is the distinguishing feature of spirituality in relation to theology. Objectivity is not irrelevant to spirituality, as McGinn's work so marvelously illustrates. Indeed, objectivity is an essential feature of good work in spirituality. 
But engagement, self-implication is the hallmark of the discipline. The truth of reason is not obliterated by the truth of personal transformation, but assumes the role of facilitation rather than mastery. In the field of spirituality, scholars have come to prefer, rather than the distinction between subjective and objective, the distinction between experiential and critical. This distinction is not a disjunction, a categorical either or, but a nuanced distinction in service of mutuality. Like justice and mercy, neither can function well without the other. But while mercy can function, cannot function at all without justice, justice can function without mercy, but the result is less than satisfactory because it dehumanizes rather than converting as our prison system massively and tragically demonstrates. Spirituality devoid of theology, if not blind, is at least severely nearsighted. And theology without spirituality is dry, if not tasteless. When I was a child, I heard my father say something that has been of enormous importance to me in hindsight in trying to understand the place of spirituality and especially that specialization, which we call mysticism, in relation to systematic and moral theology. My father was a psychologist during the very earliest years of that discipline's arrival in the Catholic Academy, where it encountered more than a little resistance because of the suspicion, especially in clerical circles, that psychology was really more about sex than about mental health. And perhaps it was partly that suspicion that made psychology attractive to so many, especially the young. But my father had another hypothesis. I heard him remark to my mother one evening, the real reason most college kids want to take psychology courses is to find out if they're crazy. Much later, I realized that the real reason a lot of people want to study spirituality is to find out not just how to think correctly about God, which theology can help them do, but what it means to really know God somewhat comparable to wanting not just to know what craziness is in the abstract, but whether I'm crazy. This is what we mean by saying that spirituality is not an alternative to theology, another theoretical sacred discipline, but it is a non-negotiably self-implicating knowledge of God and the things of God. People often study spirituality in part, not just to know about the relationship with God, but to participate indeed in, and indeed to deepen in that relationship. A second and equally important difference in my view between theology and spirituality is that theology can and does study anything and everything that does or can function in the relation of the human subject to God insofar as it is related to God. Thus, you can have a theology of childhood or of work as well as of the Trinity or the church. Theology in the pure sense, for example, systematic theology of the Trinity, incarnation, pneumatology, ecclesiology, and so on, aims to discover the relation of all reality to God in order to understand better, not only God, but the realities in themselves. Spirituality and a fortiori its ultimate specialization, mysticism, is interested in the relationship itself, especially as my relationship with God is enlightened by it. Like not just what it means to be crazy, but whether I am crazy. Not just what it means to relate to God, but whether and how, whether and how I am related to God. One, not the only, but I suspect the primary reason for studying Teresa of Avila's prayer is to understand my prayer or the prayer of those I'm assisting. This is not a matter of application, but of analogy. And it is not one-to-one, -one, but asymmetrical. If theology has sometimes liked to think of itself as scientific in method and outcome, spirituality has tended to think of itself on the model of the humanities. The humanities make liberal use of the natural sciences insofar as they are helpful. But there is no chemical test for how beautiful a painting is, or even whether it is beautiful at all. 
<laughs> Enhanced subjectivity rather than intellectual objectivity is the primary purpose of humanistic study. Objective knowledge is not an end in itself in the humanities, but a means, albeit an indispensable one, to an end. One of the beauties of Bernard McGinn's treatment of the mystics within his essentially historical and theological work is his sensitive handling of what we might call the spiritual aesthetics of different eras and figures. One can place very different paintings into the general class classification, for example, of abstract expressionism. But there is no mistaking a Mark Rothko for a Margaret Mitchell. One can speak in general about Jesus mysticism, but one cannot talk about the nature mysticism of Francis of Assisi and the erotic mysticism of Teresa of Avila as two examples of a single kind of thing. One of the main differences between science and the humanities is that science wants to minimize the distinctiveness or idiosyncrasy of individual cases, that is particularity, in the service of theoretical generalization, unity and clarity and the reduction of ambiguity. While art highlights and concentrates on distinctiveness in the service of individuality and beauty, which is never generic, but always irreducibly particular. Systematic theology has far more interest in what, ca what cases have in common, namely governing principles, than spirituality, which glories in the irreducible distinctiveness among them. We could say that self-implication or experiential involvement is the distinguishing feature of spirituality, both as lived reality and as an academic discipline which studies that reality. And mysticism is the most vivid instance of self-implication in the religious quest. One thing that is so remarkable about the massive work of Bernard McGinn on the mystical texts of the Western tradition is that he has not tried to eliminate the idiosyncratically experiential in the individual mystics in order to generalize about mysticism as such, but to illuminate mysticism theologically and psychologically and historically as it occurs in unique individuals and situations. <laughs> that may have something to do with the fact that the originally planned three volumes have become seven and only reached to the 17th century. And amazingly, he has also done it with all the critical acumen we would expect from the superb theologian that he is. At risk of oversimplification for the sake of clarity, theology, we might say, does its thing when it illuminates the experience of union with God, that is spirituality. Spirituality does its thing when it facilitates union with God. McGinn has shown us by doing it literarily how this happens in the lives and works of the people in whom it has most impressively and remarkably happened, namely the mystics of the Western tradition. His work is important, not only for those who are academically equipped to read it, but for those to whom it will be mediated by preaching, spiritual direction, and other forms of ministry. Mysticism understood substantially rather than disciplinarily is important for all believers, whatever their own level of spiritual development, insofar it is, as it is the personal experience of union with God. Theology and spirituality are the disciplines which undergird that mediation. Spirituality assures theology that it is valid. Theology assures spirituality that it is true. This reciprocal connection is seen, known, recognized, especially in the mystics, in whom this coincidence of the good and the true has actually happened existentially and experientially. <laughs> on this side of the grave. This gives us all hope that it will be validated in our own experience, if not in this life, in the next. In the mystics, the realities of creation, incarnation, transformation, and resurrection become not just doctrines, but experience. We see in them the whole mystery accomplished, at least to some extent, as it was in Jesus, 
And thus we can both believe and imagine its achievement in us. We have Bern begin to thank for his lifetime of fruitful labor to make this mysterious process available to us in the lives and works of the greatest figures in our spiritual tradition for our contemplation and imitation. Thank you, Bernie, for all you have taught and written and been for us, your admiring colleagues and friends. Thank you, um, that was wonderful. Um, and we continue now with um, David Tracy for his response. Yes, you can hear me. Yes. yes. As Professor McGinn argues persuasively in the ninth volume of his magisterial history of Western Christian mysticism, in the last 25 years of the 17th century, a grave crisis occurred for mysticism in the West and therefore for all Western spirituality and theology. Earlier debates on mysticism and theology from the 13th century forward have been intensified by the 17th century into an unnerving crisis constituted by an increasingly violent anti-mystical position taken by some scholastic theologians and by some church officials. It takes all of Bernard McGinn's characteristic judiciousness, balance, and pluralistic spirit to do justice to the fierce controversy over quietism in those years. First, the Italian mysticism of the 17th century, largely focused in Milenos on the issue of passive contemplation and debates over acquired and infused contemplation. Second and more famously, the French debates on mysticism ultimately focused by especially Fenelon on the controversial issue of pure love. What is it? Fenelon made it clear that he was indeed a mystical theologian, but had been introduced into love mysticism as an experience by the remarkably original mystic, Jean-Marie Guillon. Both Guillon and Fenelon were criticized, eventually violently, by Bishop Jacques Benin Bossuet who was in fact the most powerful churchman in France at the court of Louis XIV. For Louis, any novelty, as he said, was anathema and quietism was novel. As well as Louis's famous secret wife, the formidable Madame de Maintenon, who was in fact originally a sponsor of both Guillon and Fenelon and she turned, until she turned so strongly effectively, first against Guillon and then also against Fenelon. So fascinating, both positively and negatively, are the main characters in these famous French 17th century debates on mysticism, that it takes all of Bernard McGinn's judiciousness, which is amazing, and balance to describe these unsettling larger than life personalities. For example, the all powerful tyrant Louis XIV, who considered himself despite his full ignorance of theology capable of deciding all spiritual and religious issues and did. For example, he unjustly imprisoned Madame Guillon and exiled Archbishop Fenelon to a sea in distant Cambrai. 
The anti-quietism roles of both the indomitable Madame de Maintenon and the unrelenting, and it must be said bullying, Bishop Bossuet were far more complex and interesting and troubling than even those of their master, Louis XIV. Now, Bernard McGinn's basic sympathies are, I think, clearly with Guillaume, a genuine love mystic, and Fenelon, who was a first-rate philosopher of Descartes on the infinite, as well as an erudite and recondite mystical theologian on his own. McGinn's judiciousness, unlike my own, as you can see, obviously more partisan attitude, does not disallow his quiet passion coming to the defense of 17th century mystical theology as itself in fundamental harmony with traditional monastic mysticism from the third to the 12th century, as well as the interiorized mystical theology of the 12th to the 17th century. Above all, I think, Bernard McGinn shifts the reader's attention in this volume away from the much recited, indeed, perhaps all too famous story of the conflicts of the main extraordinarily interesting characters, Louis XIV, Madame de Maintenon, Innocent XII, Guillaume, Fenelon, Bossuet, to the far more important subject matter of the debate on, this, on quietism, namely the texts, not the personalities of the various participants, including Bernard McGinn's own very valuable new translation of the Central Vatican texts on quietism in this volume. Here Bernard McGinn's convincing textual hermeneutics clarifies the theological issues at stake far more deeply than further attention to the fascinating personalities of the principles, texts rather than personalities is surely the soundest hermeneutical principle for a theology of mysticism. And McGinn keeps to it throughout all nine volumes. <clears throat> Finally, two theological suggestions of my own on one way, I suggest, by which Bernard McGinn's remarkable study of the history of mysticism and mystical theology from the first to the late 17th century crisis, and I'm happy to report his forthcoming work on individual modern mystics, may be appropriated by contemporary theology. As many contemporary theologians following the lead of political liberation and feminist theologies have recognized there is a need, as in my own hermeneutical theology, for a mystical prophetic option for focusing that theology. Now McGinn's magisterial history of mysticism can easily be united to, unfortunately, there is no McGinn-like history of prophecy, but there are, of course, many partial histories of prophecy from the First Testament prophets, as studied brilliantly, for example, by Abraham Heschel, Walter Brueggemann, and several others, as well as many historical studies of later prophetic and apocalyptic traditions in the West, including those by McGinn himself with John Collins. And the fine historical studies of Joachim of Fiore, again by McGinn, or of the medieval spiritual Franciscans, a deeply prophetic group and a mystical group, or the magisterial prophetic Protestant reformers 
and the history of Protestant deeply prophetic theology from the Reformation to this day, in, to this day. Or in Ignatius Loyola, a prophetic and mystical figure, or in Anglicanism, William Temple, or in our own country, the great Reinhold Niebuhr, or in political theology, Johann Baptist Metz, Jürgen Moltmann, Rosemary Radford Ruther, Elizabeth Schussler, Fiorenza, James Cohn, Gustavo Gutierrez, Sandra Schneiders, Matthew Ashley, Leonardo Bach, John Sabrino, Maria Pila Aquino, Francis Schussler, Fiorenza, Catherine Cornel, Maria Clara Bingamer, Cornel West, and so many other prophetic theologians not only in feminist, political, and liberation theologies, but now throughout a good deal of theology. I suggest therefore that a union of the mystical and the prophetic for all theology can become the heart of contemporary Christian theology. And that is bound to deepen if Bernard McGinn's nine volumes become required reading, as I believe they should, for all contemporary Christian theologians, and especially for oncoming, for present students of Christian theology, it could change the future. McGinn's work will also help another desideratum for Western theology, both Catholic and Protestant, Namely, that Western theologians will finally learn more from Orthodox theology, which unlike us Westerners, has always considered all true theology, mystical theology, and contemplative and cosmic theology. Moreover, a new mystical prophetic Christian theology across the board of different theologies, there will never be just one, will also be in a better condition to be in deeper conversation with contemporary Jewish theology, whose own modern prophetic, as it's usually called ethical monotheistic tradition, has been deeply enriched by the extraordinary scholarly recoveries of Jewish mysticism for the tradition by Gershom Sholem, Moshe Idel, Paul Mandas Flor, as well as such younger Jewish mystical prophetic theologians <coughs> as Susan Shapiro, Stephen Kepnes, and many others. At the same time, any mystic prophetic Christian theology will also become ever more open to learning from the extraordinary complexities in both prophecy and mysticism and of the two together in the history of Islamic theology, especially of course, in the great mystical prophetic Sufi Islamic traditions. Needless to say, any deep mean of Christian theology's mystical side will also open it even further as it has begun to do in the last 50 years to the great Eastern traditions, now in fact also global Western traditions, mystical traditions especially, who are also becoming prophetic, Buddhism, as now mystical prophetic in what is named social Buddhism, Taoism, or the relationship of Buddhism and Taoism to traditional civic, one might even say prophetic Confucianism in the all important phenomena in China and Japan called Neo-Confucianism, as well of course as Hinduism in its many forms especially its extraordinary philosophical form. In sum, what I hope is the increasing influence of Bernard McGinn's great accomplishment in this nine volume history of Western mysticism can only expand exponentially. <laughs>
as the years go on. In reading and rereading each McGinn volume as it arrived over the many years of its emergence, I have reread every volume. I have come to feel about his accomplishment what Gerard Manley Hopkins said about the glorious flight of the Windover, a falcon. Namely, my heart in hiding stirred, the achieve of it, the mastery of the thing. Thank you. Thank you, wonderful. Thank you to all the respondents, Sandra and David. I will now yield the floor to uh, Bernie McGinn for a brief response to your responses. Yeah, yes, I, I, I will be brief. I want to thank uh, both these old friends, Sandra and, uh, and David. They give me so much to think about. But I, I do have one, one or two reflections, and I would like to open it up to uh, Sandra. I, I, I thank you very much for the emphasis. Oh, let me start this. Uh, by saying the, what I call a codependence of theology and spirituality is absolutely central. And I think no one has done more to emphasize that over the last 30 years than Sandra. Uh, start with that. But secondly, I really uh, appreciate what you said about the aesthetic approach, if you will, um, that I've tried to use in the, in the course of the work uh, when I first studied mysticism, of course, you know, there was a hierarchy. Uh, Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross were at the top. This is the Catholic view. And other people were all right, depending on how far they came close to Teresa and John. You could, you could rate them from A plus down to C minus. What I tried to do, my attention to the text, by the, the hermeneutical aesthetic that, that you pointed out, was to read each mystic on his or her our own from within in so far as that's possible. And of course, you'll have favorite mystics. I mean, I am a great fan of Meister Eckhart, especially, but we have to be able to try to understand what they were trying to do in the historical context. And that was part right from the beginning of what I tried to do in, in, in the presence of God. I'm not sure I've always succeeded, but that was what my, my, my effort was. Um, and some of that, uh, is also present in the remarks that David just made, uh, because as, as David emphasized, uh, the texts and what the texts say are central. My approach has been a textual approach. We don't have any direct access to the consciousness of a mystic. What we have is mediated possible connections through textual evidence. And that's what's crucial. So the study of the uh, mystical textuality, I think is really crucial. And, and I'm not the first person, Michel de Soto, and, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and many others have, have emphasized that. And that's why philosophical approaches, which don't care about texts, but exercise, exercise little pieces of mystical testimony mm -hmm. in terms of their own philosophical approaches, I think is going about things exactly the wrong way. So the textual hermeneutics there is also significant. I think that's the connection between what Sandra had to say and what David said. Finally, two briefer points. The mystical prophetic, and David has done so much to raise that dimension of theology up in the course of his work, is absolutely essential. And I think I've touched on this in various ways in the course of the history, but it was never as important a focus as it could have been. I wrote about Joachim and Fiore. I wrote about, you know, some of the radical reformers and, uh, and the other. But I think that uh, seeing that prophetic mystical dimension as we can now, because we view it from a 21st century, 20th, 21st century perspective, makes that more important than I had imagined when I began this history or that I was conscious of as I was writing the history. So I, I would certainly I would certainly emphasize that to to a great extent. <clears throat> and finally, the orthodox dimension. When I began writing the series, I intended to try to also incorporate the history of orthodox mysticism. Mm 
But I realized from the perspective of, of textual accessibility, my Greek was weak. I had no Syriac. I had no Russian, et cetera, et cetera. The history of these of that tradition has to be done by people who can control the texts, who have the languages. So I looked at some orthodox theolo mystical theologians, but only insofar as they impinged on the West. I would like to see somebody write the full history of orthodox theology, but they have to, as I say, have linguistic skills that I realized I did not possess. May, the, may that history be written soon. Great, so thank you for that. And let's begin with a, a Q and A. Um, there are a questions uh, from the audience, but I would like to start it off with, with a question that I think goes straight to the heart of this volume. And that is why, why quietism, why passivity was seen as such a danger. Um, you, can, you can imagine various forms of mysticism that could give rise to being subversive, but, but quietism focused in love could seen as, as an edifying thing, right? So what, what is the, the salient point about quietism that makes it perceived, uh, being perceived as so, so dangerous? So explosive, potentially. Yes, well, I, I think what's happening in Western society, it's not just in the church, but it's also in, in, in absolute disgoverments. Mm -hmm. Increasing regularization, organization, and insistence on activity in service of the institution, mm -hmm. the institution of the Catholic Church, the institution of the French monarchy, et cetera, et cetera. And so the, the, the quietists are seen as opting out from a kind of social control, which involved, of course, also a control of women, control of uh, every aspect of, of society. And it was running contrary to <clears throat> what the papacy had become in the Counter-Reformation period and afterwards, and also what major Catholic monarchies were, as we see in the case of Spain and especially in the case of France. Yeah. I like to put it this way. The ideal of Ignatius of Loyola was in contemplazione activus, to be active in contemplation. Yeah. The ideal of Basue was to be in contemplation, not even in contemplazione, but to be activus in perfectione. Mm -hmm. All act, uh, it perfection did not consist in interiority or prayer. It consisted in activity and being a part of the, act, the active organization of, of church and state. <clears throat> so passivity is running contrary to uh, social and cultural changes of, of tremendous power in the, uh, in the 18th, 17th, 18th century. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I would like to uh, invite Professor Kevin Hughes to pose his question live, if we can make that work. <clears throat> I'm here, yes. Please go uh, ahead, please go ahead, Kevin. Kevin, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, it's good to be here. Uh, thank you one and all. Um, I wondered if we could follow in the same uh, uh, straight uh, line of thought that, uh, that Wilhelmine has offered here already. And, and think about, uh, um, is there a relationship between the kind of state-centered absolutist politics that you talked about and a kind of um, ecclesial extrinsicism that uh, focuses on the objectivity of grace and uh, the role of authority? And, uh, uh, you know, are those things sort of uh, intertwined? It seems to me that, I mean, when you look at the controversy uh, between, between uh, Fenelon and Bossuet, it seems that there's an, there's an ecclesial politics at work there too. And uh, does, is that sort of theologically or ecclesially dangerous in the way that, uh, that you're, the, you've already spoken to the political danger? Well, I think they're part of the same, uh, part of the same project. I mean, at the end of the crisis book, you know, I talk about three kind of uh, conditions, if you will, that may help explain the, the crisis of quietism. And the first of them is what I call it, you know, the changing role of interior religion. Interior religion is seen as under suspicion uh, rather than uh, in some way celebrated. But there's another, and, and that includes all of those dimensions that you just spoke about and various others. But a second major dimension is what I call the implosion of mysticism. The implosion of mysticism. In the late 16th and in the 17th century, 
you can see the mystics themselves in a certain sense, oh, you could call it a kind of navel gazing, <clears throat> concentrate more and more and more on certain specific issues. They narrow the focus from the very rich traditions that you find in people like Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, and let alone in the earlier tradition. So there is a sense in which mysticism in its over-systematization, um, its over-psychologization, that's been much studied by many, in which mysticism itself was under internal crisis. So it was the mix, if you will, the match between the internal crisis when mysticism itself is, is internally under dispute and the external crisis of a more and more externalized absolutist church and state that I think was a major part of what I call the explosion in this sense. The mystics were partly to blame themselves. And let me just give an example. Fenelon's Maxims of the Saints. It's a very strange book. He tries to reduce the rich texture of mysticism to a kind of science, a kind of early modern science. And he says that, you know, by lining up certain propositions, giving you the plus, the, the positive side and the negative side, it's extremely artificial. And I believe no one has ever read the Maxims of the Saints as deep spiritual reading, the way they would even read um, uh, Molinos' spiritual guide. There was this over scientific, if you will, proto enlightenment almost mentality, despite the fact that Fenelon himself was a very deep and I think true mystic. <clears throat> when he tried to defend Guillaume, he turned to the Maxims of the Saints, which I think was basically a mistake if you read the book. He himself felt it was a mistake because he tried to issue a second edition right away after the first one was published in the midst of the controversy with Bossuet. He wanted to get ahead of Bossuet. <clears throat> so he published his work a month before Bossuet. Then I think he sat down and read it and he began correcting it. He began adding depth to it. That version was never published. It's only been rediscovered in the 20th century. Poland, who was in? <laughs> Thank you. Um, we'll continue, if this technology allows us, with a question by Andrew Preveau from Boston College, I believe. Andrew, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, and uh, th thanks, Bernard, again for a wonderful uh, talk, and, and thanks to the other presenters. My question is about the ecumenical context here. Um, since the condemnations were coming from Catholic leaders, including the Pope, um, did this have an effect or a similar effect in Protestant uh, churches, you know, a sort of chilling effect on mysticism? Or conversely, was it perhaps actually a kind of revital uh, revitalizing thing to see, well, the Catholics are abandoning the mystical project uh, where perhaps Protestants are taking it up, you know, receiving folks like Guyon more positively. I, I'm just curious to hear your, your thoughts about how far this crisis extended ecumenically. Very, very much the latter. The Protestants, especially what we'd call the free church tradition, not the established churches, uh, you know, particularly the, uh, particularly the Lutherans and others, the free church Protestants, they loved the quietists. They began translating them into English, into German and various other languages. And they read them extensively in the 18th and the 19th century. There's a whole history of these translations and important figures, including people like John Wesley, who were very much influenced by the quietist tradition. Uh, and uh, so that's another whole chapter. It, it's been written about, uh, there are a number of good articles and, and, and books on that, but quietist mysticism is alive and well in free church Protestantism in the 18th and 19th century and leads to very, in very, very interesting fashion. What they had to do, it's kind of funny, when they translated uh, Guillaume, for instance, and, and Fenelon, and even Petrucci, the Protestants often excised all the really the Catholic stuff, talking about the saints, talking about spiritual direction, talking about the sacraments, which these people did. They only left an interior religion, which is what they were looking for. Thank you. I'll continue with a question that was uh, posed anonymously, so I can't mention anybody's name here. But um, this person asks, I understand thinking mysticism with the prophetic, 
However, in our contemporary context, wouldn't it be more insightful to relate mysticism with wisdom literature? Oh, I think the two are not exclusive. And I'd like to hear maybe what, what Sandra and David would have to, yeah. have to say about that, because certainly early Christian mysticism grows out of the wisdom traditions in very, very powerful ways. That's a long story, and I won't get yeah. into it in any detail here. So I think both the prophetic tradition and the wisdom tradition are important scriptural rootings of, 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 of the mystical tradition. But maybe David and Sandra would have a word or two on that as well. Yeah. May I ask Sandra if you want to react to that? Well, I, I very much agree with, uh, with <laughs> Bernie on that. Um, I, I mean, certainly the, the, the Song of Songs uh, is the, what, the classic text of, mm -hmm. of all the mystics. Uh, and, you know, that's definitely sapiential literature from scripture. But um, I, I'm not sure I grasp the, um, uh, the, the question exactly, but uh, the, the, the biblical loci, if you will, where the mystics go uh, for, their, uh, for their nourishment, for their... Uh, uh, and their their justification, I think, many times, many times, of what they're what they're talking about uh, is certainly scripture. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, uh, which is what led me to what I was reading and thinking about what I was saying tonight to uh, uh, to uh, align mystical uh, literature and the interpretation of mystical literature with scripture with the interpretation of scripture. Uh, it's not the, the proper dialogue partner in one sense is not systematic theology, mm -hmm. it, it's scripture. Yeah, yeah, that's really the force of this question, I think. David, do you care to respond to it also? Well, I agree with what both my colleagues have said about the relationships in scripture, it seems to me is very clear between the wisdom tradition, the prophetic, and the apocalyptic tradition, which is originally a wisdom tradition. Mm -hmm. I'd add, uh, as a philosophical theologian mainly, that I, always, that I saw no reason why when Greek philosophy entered Christian theology, it also opened as in figures like Plotinus, who was, and for that matter, Plato, it also opened it to the mystical traditions in, in the Bible itself. And that seems to be very important to keep in mind that there is nothing anti-philosophical or anti-metaphysical about the mystical tradition, nor is there anything anti-mystical about the philosophical and metaphysical traditions. I always thought Whitehead was wise to say, too general, I, but of course, but insightful that Christianity begins as a religion that then sought among other things for a philosophy mm -hmm. and found one. <laughs> Buddhism begins as a philosophy and sought for a religion and found one. <laughs> These uh, relationships are very rarely as conflictual as some people try to make them. I, <laughs> words, yes. I, I, I would just throw in, I think that the developments that have gone on uh, uh, so vigorously in the last 10, 20 years with regard to theopoetics is very closely related to this. Yes. 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 Yeah. Bernie, go ahead. If, I, if I could add one, one thing here, one of the major themes in the history of Christian mysticism is the relationship between the Liber Scripturae and the Liber Experientiae, the book of the Bible and the book of experience. The book of experience was a term created by Bernard of Clairvaux in the third of his sermons on the Song of Songs, where he starts out by saying, today we're going to read in the book of experience, because the first two had dealt with the book of scripture, where he laid out what the, you know, where the Song of Songs fits in the Bible, et cetera. So those two books are essential to the history of Christian mysticism. For the first 12 centuries, almost all Christian mysticism is expressed in biblical genres, commentaries, sermons, et cetera, et cetera. 
From that time on, you begin to get what we would call the Liber Experientiae, people talking the treatises of their own experience, visionary experiences, et cetera. It's how you balance, how you balance the two books, the Liber Scriptura and the Liber Experientiae that becomes crucial. Did the quietists overemphasize the Liber Experientiae? Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting question. Mm -hmm. uh, John of the Cross did not, nor did Teresa, mm -hmm. but maybe some people in the 17th century did. Mm -hmm. well, Here's a question from um, Glenn Lemondowski. Um, who asked, um, having finished your vo uh, nine volume survey of mysticism, what changes would you now make in your volume one introduction and prospective outlay of what you were hoping to be doing as you wrote? <laughs> and the, question the question continues particularly about origin, whether you would situate him differently now than you did in the beginning. But in general, I think that's that's an interesting question to ask at the completion of your project, how you look back to now to how you set it up. Uh, well, I may be kind of pigheaded, but I wouldn't change the major insights. Mm -hmm. I would change a lot of the details. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I would change where, <clears throat> where Arjun fits in. One of the things I didn't emphasize in the early volumes was the role of transformation. Mm -hmm and how crucial the transformative character of mystical consciousness actually is. And I think that that needed more, more needed to be done with that. Yeah. I would also go back, I think a little bit more into the, into the scriptural bases. I had, had a little chapter on that, uh, but a lot more could have been done with that. And of course, in detail over the course of, you know, many, uh, Volumes, I've changed my attitude on particular kinds of things. My, <clears throat> excuse me, my model of the three layers kind of broke down between layer two and layer three. Mm -hmm. They bleed into each other in the 16th and 17th century. Yeah. There's no clear mark of deep, deep, this there. And so that I would, I would <clears throat> certainly rewrite a little bit. Yeah. But my basic emphases, I think, I, are things that I, I've, I held on to, despite okay. criticism. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, here is um, going to be a live question, again, from Gary Sparks, also an alum of the Diff School. Gary, can you pose a question, please? Sure, just uh, real quick. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, it has to do with possible expansion of your second appendix, uh, on the volume, particularly in Spanish mysticism, if you were to expand the scope, not just temporally and say into the 17th century, but geographically to the Spanish Americas and possibly even the Philippines, um, do you see any notable figures, Sor Juana de la Cruz comes to mind, but I'm sure there's others that either escape this crisis. And so there's sort of a continuation of the more traditional strand of mysticism that you've explored in the series or is there something about what they're doing as spiritual intellectuals that just maybe sort of is too far removed from what would be called mysticism, uh, maybe too modern, too Cartesian rather than Neoplatonic, so to speak? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question that I can't give an accurate answer to. I included a few figures from Latin America, but very much by way of appendix, as you point out. And it was largely because I, it's not a literature that I know very well. I have the feeling that there are some very important figures, 17th, 18th century on in Latin America, and maybe in the Philippines about which I know nothing, that might well be a whole new way of looking at Western mysticism set in a new cultural and historical environment. And I think that that is work that really needs to be researched, I would say. Th thank, you for the, uh, thank you for the observation but I'm reaching the end of my knowledge at this stage <laughs> or my expertise of any kind. Yeah, yeah. Um, here's a question from uh, Larry Greenfield who asks, does the recent research on consciousness and philosophy of mind increase our historical understanding of mysticism? Thank you, Larry, uh, for this question. And that's another uh, a question that I don't have a good answer to. I've read a little bit of this literature and have gotten a number of good insights into different kinds of things. 
But it's a very vast literature. And so uh, I, I can't give you an accurate kind of answer. I wish I had another 20 years to read much more extensively in this kind of literature. But I think it would change some of the ways in which I'm thinking about this. Okay. I won't satisfy you, but um, that's all I can tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me uh, go through the questions. Here's a question from, um, wait, I, I just have a text to look for, from um, Stephen Lukianov, which we will also take live. So Stefan, can you ask that question? I may have to ask it because it's pertinent. It relates to relation east-west. The question is, since uh, Nicodemus of Athos compiled the Philokalia around the time described in this presentation, is there a connection between the Greek church restoring such early mystical sources and the repression in the West? I guess I would say there's more a contrast than, than there is a kind of coherence in any way. It's not that there weren't figures in the 18th century weren't looking back to the past. You know, Wesley, whom I mentioned before, edited a, a works of Western mystics to try to bring them uh, to, to his, uh, his uh, people he was preaching to. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think much more so, the East, because theology is always mystical theology, recovers their tradition in Nicodemus and Silicalia in a very powerful way. So one of the great mystical texts Whereas the West doesn't do that seriously until the 20th century, as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah. The Rezos Mont theology. Yes, and, you know, the yeah. pleasure to go back to the fathers, you know, go behind neo-scholasticism and then even scholasticism and say, let's read the fathers. Yes. Let's recover the fathers. Yeah. Here is a, a question by an anonymous attendee, but it's an interesting question. Uh, it's a question about eroticism. So eroticism is so important in mysticism. How do we capture this in terms of quietism and the loss of language? Well, Madame Guillon is one of the great, you know, love, love mystics, as, as David pointed out. She comments on the Song of Songs. She's the first woman to write a full commentary on the Song of Songs, which she wrote in two weeks. I know she, she wrote in a day and a half. You know, she wrote an 8,000 page explication of the whole Bible. So she got rid of the Song of Songs in a day and a half because she wrote her whole explication in three months. Mm -hmm. Automatic writing, God, God oh. told her. But that's a fascinating, uh, uh, if you will, monument of erotic mysticism yeah. from uh, the first woman. Other women had used the Song of Songs. Guillaume's the first one to write a full commentary. Yeah. So there is certainly a, a strong element of, <clears throat> of erotic mysticism in some, excuse me, some but not all of the quietists. Yeah. And now a question more towards the present from David um, uh, Franz, uh, who asks, assuming that there's still some bent towards systemization and maintaining boundaries, what might be the most important ecclesiastical lessons for the present? Well, I think the ecclesiastical lesson for me, I, I put it in terms of Baron von Hugel's distinction between the three elements in religion, the institutional, the intellectual, and the mystical, mm -hmm. and the necessity for having a balance between these three elements. Mm -hmm. What happened, I think, especially from the 18th century, particularly strong in the 19th century, 20th century, the institutional element in Christ, uh, Catholicism, at least, maybe not all Christianity, the institutional element, and to some extent the intellectual, overcame the mystical. What we've seen in the 20th century is the reassertion of the mystical element and its equal importance, not domination, but its importance in terms of its integration with the institutional and the intellectual. I think von Hugel, who wrote that, remember, in the early 1900s, was prescient in, in seeing that necessity. And it's part of what has been playing out, particularly in the latter part of the 20th century and now in the 21st century. So it does change ecclesiology, just change our view of the church. 
Great. Well, we, we've come to the last question, which I have the privilege to ask. Okay. And it's, um, if you surveying again your, your, your entire um, uh, number of volumes, if you would have to um, pinpoint a difference, say, between pre-modern and modern mysticism, because we're now really in modernity, what would be one or two point insights that you really say, well, this, this defines modern mysticism and can, cannot be found in, in the pre-modern tradition, given that, that there's also a lot of continuity in, in many ways. Well, I think I distinguish between not only modern mysticism, but for want of a better word, postmodern mysticism or post postmodern mysticism. <laughs> because I think really uh, postmodernism's critique of modernism, in a certain sense, has exposed us to the importance of elements of the pre modern. Now, those categories, I don't even like postmodern very, very much, but I do think it represents a cultural shift where the criticism of enlightenment rationalism is what I'd call it, enables us to go back behind the enlightenment mm -hmm. and go back behind 1700 or even 1650 mm -hmm. and to read these people in a very new way. And if you wanna call that modern, I, I would say it's, it, you know, that mm -hmm. in that sense, the, these, are, these are terms, these are categories, yeah. slippery as they are. But I think we're reading the, the ancient mystics in a new way because of the critique of rational enlightenment mentality and anthropology. Yes. And that gives us a whole new opportunity. And that's gone on very strongly. I think there were people prior to the 1950, like Simon Weil, who were doing that. Mm -hmm. But it's gone on much more strongly towards the end of the 20th century, now into the 21st century. It's a new horizon. Thank you. I think I'll invite Michael um, the Chevalier to come on again. There you are. Um, well, greetings and um, welcome everyone. Sorry, welcome. Where am I? It's a, such a fantastic program. Thank you so much, Bernie, um, for, for not just uh, the, the gift of today's conversation, but really the gift of this book um, and the whole series. It's of course always a shame that we don't have time for a full conversation, mm -hmm. um, but uh, of course, the conversation doesn't have to end here. Um, and you can just follow the link within the chat uh, to take the conversation home, uh, so to speak. Um, but, uh, and that's true, of course, of all of our authors here. Um, but also I wanna extend uh, my gratitude to um, Sandra and David for your, con your contributions to tonight's conversation and Professor Otten for really moderating a fantastic conversation here, navigating between 34, 40, 50 questions that we had coming um, through. Uh, th there's just a, 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 obviously a lot of richness um, within this text and the, I, in this I, topic. I, if I could say one more thing, if people have questions for me that they want to send me on email, mm -hmm. I would be happy to receive them. We begin at UChicago EDU. I may not respond to you right away, but I would certainly welcome any questions or observations you have that we didn't have time for tonight. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Bernie, for that. Um, and uh, finally, um, I, I wanna thank you all for joining us um, and please come again, join our mailing list uh, to stay tuned for future programs in mysticism, monasticism and modern theology. Uh, tonight's event uh, was co-sponsored by the Collegium Institute, uh, the Martin Marty Center for Public Understanding of Religion and Herder and Herder. I'm grateful for uh, each of these co-sponsors for helping to ensure the success of this event and really the success of this celebration uh, of the publication of this last volume of this series. Um, finally, I invite you to support us. Help get word out to your friends and parishes or schools, other networks, follow us on social media, share our materials. And finally, you can help become a, you can help us financially by becoming a supporter of our work today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate helping us to continue to provide programs like these for free to viewers like you. Um, we had over 800 people register for today's event, over 400 tune in live, and many more who are gonna follow up on the link that they get tomorrow to follow up on the conversation that they couldn't participate in because we're at 7 p.m. Central and uh, we can't do everything synchronously um, with all of our friends in Europe. So 
Once more, thank you to our full panel. And we look forward to um, welcoming our panel and you, our viewers, back soon. Have a wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend.